Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome this afternoon, this early evening actually, to our webinar, uh, which we have dubbed the National Building Regulations or the Building Code 2020. Uh, this uh, evening we'll be discussing this pertinent uh, document that uh, happens to be something that will guide our practices going forward and the discussion that has been in the limelight for a very long time. Um, this uh, evening except, expect to hear from uh, a very, very uh, distinguished uh, panelists and even from our president. And I hope that you have prepared yourselves to receive, but also we are also prepared to uh, get questions and comments from you. So welcome everyone. And uh, I will be your host and moderator for the session. My name is uh, architect Florence Nyole, the chairperson of the architects chapter at AAK. And uh, we welcome all of you to this session. Karibu sana. I would like to invite our president, architect Mogure Njendu, to give her opening remarks. And thereafter, we will begin the session uh, for the evening. Karibu sana, architect Mugure. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Florence Nyole, for those um, introductory remarks. Um, I am uh, pleased, um, as the president of the Architectural Association of Kenya, to welcome you to this uh, webinar session. Um, I know we do have a few people in the audience who may not be AAK members. Um, so for their sake, allow me just to introduce AAK. It's always um, an important thing to do. Um, the Actual Associ Association of Kenya is really Kenya's leading uh, built and natural environments um, sort of professional association. And um, the reason I say so is because we're uniquely sort of an umbrella association. We incorporate architects, quant surveyors, town planners, engineers, landscape architects, environmental design consultants, and construction project managers. Uh, besides that, we also bring professionals together in national and county governments, the private sector, academia, and really do act as a link between professionals and stakeholders in the construction industry, including policymakers, manufacturers, real estate developers, financial institutions, among others. Um, AK has been a very key stakeholder in the building code with a number of our members and leadership invo involved both in advocacy as well as drafting of the various versions of the building code over the years. Um, I think I want to give a, li a little bit of background to the history of, of the building code and various attempts at revisions over the years, just to contextualize uh, the importance of today's conversation. So the first um, formal building code in Kenya was um, the local government adoptive so sort of bylaws for building. Um, order 1968. This was uh, formulated from the then existing British Imperial Codes and was adapted by the Minister of Local Government for Use and that was back in 1968. In 1995, a new set of new building regulations commonly referred to as Code 95 were then developed through the government and also private sector initiative. However, no significant success was realized through this initiative due to the failure by most of the local authorities to adopt the specific code. Um, in 1996, after the collapse of Sunbeam Building in Nairobi, the government established a commission of inquiry to look into the inadequacies that, le that led to this collapse. And this was spearheaded by an AK member and fellow, Dr. Ruben Motiso. The committee identified um, an inadequate and outdated building code as one of the biggest issues. However, again, the recommendations in the report were never implemented. In 2007, private sector players, again, we got involved in the building code, primarily with concerns that the existing code was very prescriptive, uh, focused on mostly construction materials. Um, the prime minister then initiated the revision of the building code and mandated the Ministry of Housing to come up with a comprehensive planning and building laws and regulations document. Again, that document did more, not move far even then. In 2012, AK, because we have been at the forefront of engaging on this particular uh, topic, uh, engage Professor Rukwaro, who's on this, in, on this call today as one of the panelists to conduct research. At that time, we published a study on development control frameworks in Kenya. The study highlighted a number of challenges in the industry, including challenges in updating and enforcing zoning regulations, political interference, and weaknesses in the building code that has caused serious challenges, including loss of lives and property. These have informed the advocacy activities of AAK, including on this matter of the revision of the building code. In 2015, 
AK published Managing Building Development, and that was a policy position paper that recommended, among others, the completion of the revision to the building code to improve the development control structures in the country. AK members have made significant contribution to the review process. And really, I just want to appreciate um, all the members who have been uh, involved in these activities, Dr. Ruben Mutiso, Mutiso Professor Robert Rukwaro, Waweru Gavesha, Stephen Oundo, Robert Karioki, Julia Twitter, among many other members, including the moderator of this session, Chair of Active Chapter after Florence Nyole, Engineer Kiteme, who is, who is in this session, and also uh, landscape architect um, Gumo Karioki, again, also on this session. So despite numerous efforts by AAK and the private sector over the years, um, the building code only came back into priority in 2008. Um, and I'll ask you to take a minute. There's a question that has pop popped up on your screen, a poll, um, really just asking you how important do you feel the revised building code is to streamlining the challenges in our industry? So uh, back to my comments, the building code only came back into priority in 2008, and really it was backed by the need to improve Kenya's ease of doing business. And we continued challenges in the construction industry. The drafting of the building code reverted to being driven by national construction authority. And that is what has brought us here today. Um, the previous building code had remained unanchored in law, and that was really because of the uh, new constitution. However, with the gazettement of the Business Laws Amendment Act, it has become anchored in National Construction Authority and has brought us to the conversation of today's draft National Building Regulations 2020 or the National Building Code. As AAK, we have really remained focused and at the forefront of the delivery of an updated building code for many years and have continued to advocate for strengthening regulations in the built environment. Today, I just want to take a moment also to appreciate the push by National Construction Authority towards this draft that we will be discussing today. I want to ask every single member who's in, in this conversation, my fellow professionals, stakeholders in the built environment, uh, please do look through the document. Let's engage in a very sort of vibrant discussion um, and give your comments um, towards a better building code. And I appreciate you being here with us today. Asante Sana and back to you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President, for your uh, very uh, apt and uh, introduction of our subject matter today. And uh, like she has already uh, mentioned, there's a poll that is already running, and it's asking you how important do you feel the revised building code is to streamlining challenges in the construction industry. So feel free to respond and submit your uh, your your poll response uh, on the same, even as we proceed uh, with our webinar. Uh, without much further ado, I'd like to take a moment uh, to introduce the panelists who will be speaking to us uh, throughout this session. And I will ask each panelist to probably have their video on and when they're introduced, they can wave uh, to the audience uh, as you proceed. Um, I'll go uh, straight away to our first panelist, that is Professor Robert Chukwaro, who is the acting principal at the College of Architecture and Engineering, University of Nairobi an architect, a project manager, and has been very much involved in this particular uh, 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 period and, and process of a revision of the building code. Um, professor, you may wave to the crowd so that they know you're here with us. Yes, hello. Is it visible? Yes, we can see you and Karibu Sana. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Our second panelist, um, this is engineer Shama Ketema, a principal uh, civil uh, structural engineer and director of projects with Senprom Services Limited, who is also a member of VAK and a council member at the uh, IEK, Karibu Sana engineer Shama, and you can wave to the crowd. Thank you, architect Florence. Thank you very much. Karibu Sana. Our other panelist, uh, also known to us, is landscape architect Robert Karioki. He's the managing director, Lariac Landscapes, and a specialist in landscape architecture, urban open space design and planning, and he is also a fellow of the AAK. Karibu Sana, a landscape architect, and uh, you can wave to the audience. Is he with us or he has dropped? All right, then I will introduce him at the time when uh, we, uh, when I will be asking him a question. So to start us off, I would like to um, uh, invite Professor Requaro to also give us more light as a member, as a 
team leader actually for their ongoing uh, stakeholder engagement with the NCA and just to also give us an overview of this particular process uh, from the point of leading at uh, this particular process. Karibu Sana Professor, the floor is yours. Yes, um, uh, good afternoon everybody. I think this is a good opportunity for us to create awareness of the new drafts of building code 2020. May I start by saying that uh, as we talk, there is um, the, the existing uh, building code, which was of 1968, as it has been mentioned, and was anchored in the government lo local government uh, act, uh, come 265, and it is that code that um, we are revising. So there exists a, a document that now we want to engage in revision. And the document that we want to discuss now is the revision of that code. The, the document that we'll be talking about is the one that the National Construction Authority has been given the mandate to actually complete. And it is in the year 2019, November, that uh, the government found it necessary that we domicile the, the building court in their, in their authority. So since then, so much has happened since 19, uh, from 2019 to date, there's so much that happened that has really helped a lot to shape the new building court. So um, the, the current building court or the draft building court that we'll be talking about has been um, a perspective, it has been uh, revised through a very perspective process where all the stakeholders in the built environment have got involved, which I think is very important and, um, and and through that the, the, and through that the document that the stakeholders um, came up with it went through the due process of drafters being involved in, in actually stimulating it to a law and also after they finalized that it was also taken to attorney general's uh, office where the the drafters at, uh, at the level of the law, actually made it uh, a very comprehensive law that you have been reading with uh, very clear articles um, uh, that uh, really gives us guidance in terms of the standards that we like. Probably the next thing I want to say is that uh, the current building code or the draft building code that we have now is, 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 is a document that has certain characteristics. And some of them is that uh, it will be an adaptive by laws by the counties when it is gazetted. Uh, the next thing is that it uses, the way it is structured, it uses the construction process. That is, it starts from foundation, clearing the site foundation up to demolition stages. So it, 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 the way it is structured is, is such that all the parts are actually segmented in a way that it captures the, the construction process. The other important thing about the code is that it is performance standard based, meaning that the architects have been given the, the certain um, principles of design of floors, design of roofs, design of any other element of the building. And out of that, they can actually inject the innovations in, in coming up with the new materials, with the new construction techniques, and, and so on. So this, this code that uh, actually we are discussing is not prescriptive. It allows a lot of room for people really to improve it. The, the last thing I would like to say is that the document um, brings in a lot of new areas, a lot of new areas that were not actually present in the area code. Areas like landscaping that, that now are very clear that uh, as a standard uh, designers should be following. Areas like grazing, which you can see most of our buildings now has a lot of cladding or cutting warring has been considered. Issues like risk management 
at, at, the, at the site and also uh, considering uh, the building itself uh, that is that is, is, is you actually expose people to when you are constructing and when you don't construct well what can emanate from that so there are many other new areas that actually have been added into the new court just to make sure that it captures the emerging issues in terms of what best practices are, are doing out there as you are aware it is the Mutiso document of, of, of 1996 and uh, thereabout that actually grounded the, 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 the revisions that we are doing today, where they had actually had traveled over the world to get the best practices in other countries in the world. Probably in summary, if I could mention something to do with the, the building code now, which is the draft, uh, is that it is a document that currently looks a bit for luminous. And um, the, the good thing is that it is in parts. We can later on actually segment it in parts depending on the speciality. If it's electrical works, if it's mechanical works, if it's builders work, if it is management work and so on. So, so it's, it's a document that now looks big because of, of, of basically the inclusion of everything together during the approval stages. Otherwise it has for 24 parts, uh, the whole document has 24 parts, which I'll mention each of them very fast. And also it has uh, two schedules, one schedule dealing with figures and the other schedule dealing with tables, which I think actually uh, becomes like the, the it is it's, it's to fit. It, it, is, it also gives the, the standards to fit, for, for, for deemed to fit standards for, for people who might want to take uh, examples who might not go back to a lot of designing using the principles. Then the other aspect that uh, that also we can say about this, it has 555 um, articles or standards that uh, that really enrich when they when you implement uh, the document, when you implement what the document talks about, the built environment. And these are quite uh, inclusive. It has three 356 pages. And, and that means it's quite a document that uh, one must be quite uh, ready to read when time comes. But may I now go to, just to say about the purpose of this code. The purpose of this code is really to look at the issues of safety, issues of health, issues of, um, uh, issues of convenience um, and uh, at the site. So, and issues of security. So, so this code really, all these principles that you'll be seeing, they are really trying to ensure that the buildings that we put up actually are safe. They, they, they actually, they, they, they are very healthy in terms of lighting, penetration, a convenience of spaces in terms of their, their sizing and, and so on. So, so that one comes very, very clearly in this court. So that is the, what this court about. Is, is about. The, the other thing I want to mention at, at this time, which is very important, is, is that we are dealing, this code deals with the building control issues. It doesn't deal with development control issues. So this code is more concerned with what we design, what we construct, how we construct, what we use to construct, how we demolish, and how we maintain our buildings and how we secure our sites. That's what this building, we are confined within the, the, the peripheral of, of the plot and, and the issue they are in, in creating the physicality within the, that plot. So, so I think that should be very clear in terms of scope so that issues of planning should not, should not be put, uh, those ones are domicile in, in, the, other, in the other document of uh, physical and radius, uh, planning act. So here we are only dealing with the, then the other aspect that I want to talk about is the scope, the scope of this document. This document will be more concerned with issues of design, construction, operation, maintenance, and demolition of building. To also be concerned with the standard of building materials. To also be concerned with the building operations and disaster management at the site. And to also be concerned with the safety and security of users and the occupants of building. So that, that is the scope of this, this document. Then the next thing that uh, I wanted just to touch uh, very fast 
is the parts. I just go mentioning them so, so that at least uh, for those who are not very familiar with the document, they, they, they can actually get a very uh, as, 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 uh, um, just a straight, a straight idea of what the document is all about. So there's part one that talks about preliminaries, which deals with the definitions. There's part two that talks about siting and the space about the buildings, which actually talks about um, the planning within the plot, the, the, the frontage, the issues of obstruction of views and access to the plot. There's also issue, the part three talks about um, uh, parking spaces. And, and, and this one, we are more concerned with leaving adequate space for movement of cars and uh, in case there are lamps, the correct uh, gradient for those lamps. It also talks about the next part four talks about site preparation. And this really cons is concerned with the safety precautions that we normally take at the site, issues of scaffolding, scaffolding issues of holding and, and fencing and so on. And also issues of um, uh, site safety and, and so forth. Then the other, the other part five, part four talks about building materials. And here is where we, we are really making reference to Kenya Bill of Standards. And uh, since those are the ones that actually control the specifications and, um, and, and uh, the quality of materials that we use in the industry. Then the next part six talks about structural design. And, and I think here, the most important thing about this is that um, it, has, it has emphasized use of Euro code nine from zero to, from Euro code zero to nine, and, and also talks about the issues of structure, the structure of the building and how it should be an integrated structure to ensure safety of, of, of the buildings. Then the part seven talks about space within the building. And at this here, we are talking about the interior part of the building in terms of height and sizing of rooms. And it is very clear what standards we need to take. It also talks about part seven, part eight talks about floors. And in this one, we are more concerned with the, the issues of the contact of floors to the ground, the type of soils it get in contact with. We're also talking about um, the issues of finishes on the floors, whether they are slippery or non slippery Then part nine talks about walls. And, and, and here is where here we, we, we really concerned with the, the issues of uh, road bearing walls and, and also retaining walls and all that, and the penetration of water into the building and how we can keep it off. That is issue of water proving. So it's so we're, we're uh, given the standards under that section. Part, part 10 talks about lighting and filtration. And this area, as we, you all know, when we talk about the health of the building, these are key issues. And, and they are really well documented and given their standard in this document. And it really consider, considers the natural lighting and natural penetration to be critical when you are thinking about uh, lighting and uh, filtration. Then the other area is about part 11 talks about glazing and cladding. And this area is a new area, as you know, this is a new area of cutting, walling, and so on. And here we are more concerned with safety and the safe installation of grazing and cladding on the buildings. And, and the, the standards and measurements are given that we can easily cross work with. So I think that one is well catered for. Then part 12 talks about staircases, lifts, and escalators, which I think is, is, is well given in terms of the, the fire escape staircases, the pedestrian staircases, and the standards that go there in with. Then the part 12 talks about, part um, 13 talks about roofs. You know roofs are critical. And what is critical about roofs is the waterproofing material, the material that uh, we didn't put there. So it talks about waterproofing standards for finishes of, of, of materials that you that, that standard. Then part five, part 14 talks about water services, drainage, wastewater disposal and storm water. And, and this area, as you all know, is one area that um, we have lagged behind in most of our settlement. And it really gives the standards of, of how we should deal with the water supply, what water within, water services within the building, the storage and so on, and the drainage of that water. And also how we, we keep off uh, the rainwater within our built environment. All those standards are given. Then part four, for 15 gives up electrical installation. And, and this one really is an area that uh, comes out very clearly with standards of electrical installation in buildings. 
and how safety can be ensured. Then part 16 talks about landscaping. As I said, this is a new area. And uh, even electrical installation is a new area. It was never, was never there. And, and this area of landscaping, or that uh, part 16, really gives us uh, the requirement that we should follow when we are designing our buildings within a plot. That at least we should leave 20% of open areas where we can actually celebrate greenery and also celebrate fresh air and many other conditions that uh, we have missed of our environment. Part 17 talks about inspection and maintenance of building environment. I think one of the areas that we have lagged behind is inspection of buildings, especially after, after post-construction. So this one comes out very clearly, how buildings should be managed after it is constructed. And, and here it talks about different types of inspections that should be undertaken so that uh, we ensure that the building maintains, maintains the, the quality of, 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 of usability or habita habitability of it. So it, it really comes out very clearly on the maintenance and inspection of building after it's constructed. Then the part, seven, part 18 talks about non-waterborne waste disposal. And this talks about for those people who can't get sewage, sewage system or sewer system, they can have pit latrines. And then here it gives the standard for those pit latrines relative to the habitable areas. But uh, 19 gives the refuse disposal. Uh, it, gives, it talks about refuse disposal. So this is another challenging area about uh, waste management, which um, sometimes uh, accumulates in a place. And, and then it becomes garbage and then, uh, and then has challenges in terms of uh, environment. And, and here, what we are saying is that it gives standards of how we should deal with it and, uh, and, and, and to ensure that uh, we follow also the, the MCA laws or, or environmental management coordination laws that uh, have been put for us to control the built environment. The, the oh, other idea oh, that- uh, oh, uh, oh, Yes. Allow me to cut you short, not uh, in, a, in a way, but could you just summarize those sections? Because what we had done is to request uh, the members to go through the document uh, so that we can move forward, it's just in the interest of time. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Actually, I'll just talk about the topics. The yes. next uh, part 20 talks about requirement for different disabled persons. Part uh, 21 talks about fire safety and fire installation in buildings. Uh, part 20. Part 22 talks about demolition of buildings. Uh, part uh, 23 talks about disaster, disaster, disaster risk management in buildings. And the last part of the code talks about, um, talks about access road, school sites, and other private roads. So members, um, those are the parts that are included in the building code. I think all of you have read and they have seen that if implemented, they can transform our built environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof, for that uh, very elaborate uh, introduction to the process and the history of uh, the revision, as well as highlighting the content uh, of the building code and also its nature. I think it's it's important. We're already beginning to receive quite a few questions uh, on the question and answer uh, as well as the chat. So we'll be looking out for them. Kindly do continue posting your questions. They will be answered live and uh, we'll also look at them and respond to them in the course of this particular webinar. Um, allow me then to move to the next panelist. This is engineer Shama Kiteme. And my, first, my question to you uh, that just follows up on uh, what Prof has talked about is that the success of the building code will depend largely on the capacity of counties to monitor the implementation through professionals, uh, both as staff of the counties and also practitioners within those counties. Do you think counties are ready? And if not, what can be done? Karibu and uh, respond to this question. Thank you, Architect Florence, for that question. I'm privileged to have been uh, involved in the drafting of this uh, building code draft that we are looking at, which is currently undergoing stakeholder engagement. Now, 
I will tell you that um, in a session we just had in Kisumu, stakeholders are very categorical in pointing out that there is general lack of capacity. And so if you ask me if the counties are prepared or are equipped, I will tell you no. Now, what then can we do for the counties to be prepared to be able to probably uh, and for, I mean, carry out inspections, carry out the tasks that are expected of them as per the building code. Number one is that we need to have every department of in infrastructure, uh, housing, urban development um, in our 47 counties equipped with the manpower to employ professionals who are licensed, qualified, registered. I think that unless we have professionals in the counties, we are going to fall short of the proper implementation of the billing card. In my view, at minimum, these ministries and these departments in the counties should have at least three departments, a department on town planning, a department on architecture and a department on engineering. Now, these departments need to be headed by registered and licensed professionals who are planners, who are architects, and who are engineers. And I appreciate that it may not be possible for all the uh, counties to get these uh, professionals on board. But in instances when this is not possible, it is probably the right thing to do to engage registered professionals as consultants. What this will mean is that the process of approval of the development that is submitted is subjected to views or to scrutiny by professionals. And then approvals, they are not just approvals done by people who are not qualified to look through the designs carried out by professionals. Because when you're submitting a, 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 a drawing, for example, it is done by an architect who is a registered architect. Structural designs are done by a professional engineer, for instance. And then you have someone in the county who is not a professional. They don't have capacity to check the work of a registered professional. And so we really need to make sure that at the county level, counties have professionals. And when they are not there, we can hire consultants. Now, I'll tell you, I had one stakeholder say, we have architects, QSCs, engineers in the counties who don't have a number. That's their own way of saying these people are not licensed. Now, how do they even submit the, 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 the designs and the plans for approval? We also need to go out, probably our registration bodies or our professional associations to push these counties and avail the list of registered professionals. For instance, I know uh, Borax, Gazette people, I know um, EBK, Gazette engineers. Let the counties have the list of those registered uh, engineers so that we do not have people submitting plans uh, that are not registered. So for me, the capacity is not there, but it's something that we can move towards um, equipping our counties to make sure that uh, implementation of the billing code does not become another failure. Uh, which you know that we have taken so long preparing the draft building call. Thank you. Thank you so much, engineer, for highlighting that. And uh, I believe uh, even in our midst, uh, within the audience, uh, I've noted uh, quite a few of our own members and other members who could be working in the counties and might be able to push for us. Um, as we all, when we all began, I think this conversation is not just uh, an architect's conversation or an AK conversation, but it's a com conversation that cuts across the entire uh, built environment. And I wish to just recognize the presence of planner uh, Dominic Mutegi of NMS. Uh, he leads the development control uh, in the county, I mean, in the uh, metropolitan service. We also have uh, um, architect Steven Mwilu of NCA, who are obviously the current holders of this particular, uh, sorry, who are the holders of this particular document. 
And I also wish to note our representative at AAK, architect uh, Waweru Gadecha, who's also a, a past president AAK and a fellow at AAK, but he sits on the board of NCA, who, are, who is also in our midst. So we, we, other than just the members of AAK, I believe there are very many other people here who are listening to us. And I hope that this uh, particular conversation is useful to you. Um, I wish to proceed then to the next uh, presenter um, or other panelist uh, who has now joined us. This is uh, Plana Julia Trita, um, who is uh, well known to us. She's the chair of the town planners chapter at AAK and uh, also uh, runs her, her, her practice as a planner. And the architect, uh, Plana Julia Trita, Karibu Sana, I wish to welcome you with a question as you settle in. I think it's very pertinent. Uh, the uh, professor has gone ahead and talked about the building code dealing with the build, building control. My question would be, the building code deals largely with building control, but borrows heavily from planning or even development control uh, in as far as development control is concerned. Kindly expound on this, ensuring that differentiation between the two will be successful uh, going forward. Karibu sana plana. Thank you very much, uh, architect uh, Florence. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I first wish to just um, go back in terms of law because we always look back to when things go wrong, when, when things are not going as we had planned to, as a failure in not having law. But looking back, as you have mentioned, we do have uh, several pieces of registration policies uh, and even guidelines that uh, guide how we control development, how we build and how we construct it overall. And this is heavily bonded uh, from the planning um, fraternity. We have to acknowledge that in every um, developed country that you go to, that um, or even in our own scenario that planning precedes uh, development or any other construction or uh, intervention on land. And one of our failures has been in terms of uh, preparation of plans, as well as uh, implementation of plans which have already been approved. Uh, but more or less, I would say, in a nutshell, we don't need um, new laws per se. Uh, what I would say about uh, the building code is it, it is a good uh, piece of registration, and I'm happy I participated in the drafting of the, of the new code as we have it. And I would say most of it, especially uh, the first sections of the of the code, uh, bonus heavy in terms of what is there even in, in the new act for the for the planning uh, and land use uh, planning act or what we call PUPA 2019. Uh, I would say if properly implemented, this is a code that would help us in terms of uh, achieving um, good and ordered development. But I would also say there's a lot of room still for improvement, especially for catering for developments that do not quite meet uh, the criteria or the standards that we have set. And especially when we look at um, the informality. And when I talk of informality, most of the time we just think of slums. But I would also want us to think of informality in terms of um, the development which is already existing, uh, in terms of the tenements that we have, the Kinagidurais, the Kayones, and how we can make them better uh, and not out fall so much out of the law, but also uh, find a way of making sure that we have uh, such kind of development, developments developing within the, the guidelines and so that they are habitable and also safe for the people living therein. And I would also want to um, emphasize on what engineer said, uh, in terms of capacity at the authorities, at the county authorities, uh, not only the county government, but also at NCA, at an institution uh, such as NEMA, these people have to be equipped. We have to uh, make sure that they have the right professionals working there. Uh, something has to be done in terms of how they are able to retain professionals and also look at ways of how they can construct out the services if they are not able to retain these people on a permanent basis. And uh, the issue of contracting actually has been captured in the new uh, PLUPA regulations, which I would also want uh, to refer people to, 
to look into. Uh, with those uh, few remarks, uh, architect, I hand over to you, Florence. Thank you so much, Planner Juliet. Uh, you have really responded to that. And I think uh, the more laws we have, perhaps the more definition and, and clarification uh, of the roles of uh, all this legislation to ensure a, a quality built environment is important. And I think uh, you, you really uh, uh, highlighted some of the key issues that, uh, that uh, we are facing in that. And even as we proceed, I wish to also recognize the presence of engineer Maurice Saketch, who is the executive director uh, of NCA. Uh, he is uh, in our midst, and I hope maybe at some point at, at the plenary session, we'll be able to hear from him. I also wish to note that we have the Kenya Property Developers Association that is here with us, KPDA. We have um, uh, Stanley Miner with, with us here. Um, even as we proceed with our conversation, uh, there are polls that were shared with you earlier on, and we'll be receiving some results from that uh, in a short moment. And even as we prepare to do the same, um, as we prepare to do, to do the same, you can see here we're asking how important do you feel the, re the revised building code is uh, to streamlining, the revised building code is to streamlining challenges in the construction industry. And uh, we see that most of you feel that this is important. And so we are happy that you've been able to uh, share uh, this particular session. And I believe it's just uh, scratching the surface uh, of what exists in that building code. And we hope that we'll be moving forward and, and even going deeper into some of the uh, issues that are raised there. Now, allow me to move forward to our uh, panelist, uh, none other than a fellow a landscape architect, Ngumo Karioki, uh, Karibu Sana. I just want to ask you, a clear definition of roles of various built environment professions is critical in the implementation of the, of the building code. To what extent, and this is very important, um, has landscape architecture been incorporated in the code? And I'd wish for you to speak to us, um, having had quite a history uh, in, in, in the building code and having been part of this, do you think that it has been, uh, landscape architecture has been incorporated? And what are your thoughts on this? Karibu Sana. Thank you very much, um, uh, architect Florence. Uh, first, I would like to thank you for giving me the privilege to be able to be here today and to share. And not only that, uh, for the privilege of having been uh, invited to on the draft building code. Now, we are the youngest profession that have been represented in this code. And not only just being youngest, uh, as you have seen, if you have read the draft code, really, uh, we almost appear to be like flower girls escorting everybody else because there's very little, only four pages or three pages showing what we actually need to be. Um, when I say that I was involved and I did play my part the best I could. But I do think that uh, in the current sort of edited draft building code, uh, we've seen very little in terms of what we would consider as capacities for landscape architects, their contribution, and uh, what they really do. I think what we see in the current draft code, and I do hope uh, uh, the chairman will allow us to increase what our scope and capacities are, are that um, I think is very little. If you look at that, it only outlines a few things to do with planting. Planting is only probably about 10% of what a landscape architect's capacities are. And uh, it's important that actually incorporated significant because I do not believe once we do this building code that next year we'll be revising it. So an opportunity to actually have this incorporated is, is, uh, is actually, I would say, imperative. Um, when I look at um, the whole process and um, important for me to give a bit of a historical Treatise on this because the idea of landscape and the agitation to actually have landscape architecture recognized started a little about very early in the 80s 
there were a few landscape architects and uh, at the time and i recall even to get into the architectural association of kenya we have we had to borrow people from other professions to get in similarly now it is no longer a situation where we are only doing a, 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 a planting of flowers we have over 300 why i think it's important for this to be incorporated properly in the building code and important for certain legislation to take place because we are now training landscape architects we have over 300 graduates currently which means that in the next 10 years we'll probably have over 3000 if you look at it then it means that this profession needs an early intervention to start um, uh, contributing nationally to, to also be involved in being able to be aligned with the built environment and the associated professions. And it is important that uh, the extent of incorporation of landscape architecture in the building code uh, be considered to be important and not negligible at the best few of the capacities that i think landscape architects will be able to contribute to in in, in this uh, in the built environment and even not only that in conservation and improvement of our environment um when uh, you, you, you've had, for example, and, and uh, Engineer Shama, please forgive me because you got words out of my mouth that we do need people in uh, counties, planners, architects, and engineers. But if you notice, even engineer forgot that there is a profession called landscape architecture that is needed even in the in the in the counties. What I'm really saying is that. There has been very little knowledge, both in the professional field and even in the, in the public, of understanding what contributions we make. And I think it's very important that, uh, that now the building code is an opportunity for landscape architecture to contribute. I, for those who are a bit aware of it, know the contribution it has made in places where landscape architecture has been formally uh, in practice, like in the US, where it started over 140 years ago, Canada, Europe, and so on. Uh, we do have, and indeed, in the developing country, currently, we do need the intervention of landscape. We are starting to do super highways. We are, we are doing skyscrapers. We need to start looking at these environments clearly. So the incorporation of it, uh, Madam Nyole, is no mean fit to actually look at this seriously. Uh, as I note, you've given me only five minutes. Probably I should not a little before you more talk more belabor what I'm saying, um, uh, because I would probably get questions on that. So I do not believe that there's enough in the building code in terms of uh, incorporation of landscape architecture. Even though I do take some responsibility because I say I was in it, I was uh, involved, I was invited, but I think also we need also the younger landscape architects to contribute to this strengthening. It's not that um, I could not have done a lot of it, but uh, I recall at the time when we did this document, I provided about 70 pages of what I thought the building could or to incorporate. But uh, currently in the draft, I think we have less than four pages uh, outlining everything we're supposed to do. I think that's not uh, adequate in any way. Even if you look out in other countries, what they talk about in terms of their building codes, really that's a drop in the ocean. We do need a lot more. We think we have something to contribute and we would like the opportunity to actually add more to it. So um, I think I've more or less answered this question of uh, whether uh, there has been, the capacity is being built. We are having capacity. Currently, I believe 
we do have enough landscape architects to go around all the counties. A demand ought to be created because there is something for us to um, contribute and each county ought to have a landscape architect. I do recall when Nairobi City Council was a city council, there were, there were opportunities for four landscape architects. And I don't believe even the county government at the moment has, uh, has employed any, not that I know of anyway. And uh, so there is need for this profession to be incorporated. Really thank many you. times, yeah, thank you. So in that case, I think uh, with that, I can, I can comfortably say that I think I have more or less answered what I think in terms of uh, incorporation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Landscape Architect. You've really uh, given us your response on that. And I, I just want to pick something that you mentioned regarding the number of graduates who are coming out of the university. Um, and I think the only way they can be absorbed apart from the private sector is really within the public and uh, the counties really have a role to play to ensure that uh, all those professionals who are coming out uh, have a chance to um, uh, work within, uh, within the counties and to be able to improve uh, the built environment. So thank you very much for your for your comments. And I hope that even those those 70 pages are, might be a lot, but I hope within even the four pages, they should make a, a highlight of what is critical and important to uh, for the profession. Um, even as we proceed, we do have another call that has been posted. So do take note of that and give your comments or rather give your response. This one asks, the draft building code proposes extended defects and liability periods of a minimum of 24 months and a maximum of 60 months. What are your thoughts on this? Are they very acceptable? Should we even consider them or are they unacceptable? And I think this is a conversation that has been going on, especially with the defects liability regulations that are released in 2020. So we'd like to hear back from you regarding the same. I'd like to go back quite quickly to the planner. And as I go to the planner, also the engineer should be ready. And I want to ask, it has been said time and again, the development has preceded planning. And of course, this is very evident in our urban areas. And uh, you might have highlighted this, but we just want your definitive um, answer on the same. With several le legislation to regulate the field of planning, such as uh, WACA, that's the Urban Areas and Cities Act of 2011, CLUPA 2019, and now this building code, do you feel that more legislation, such as the draft building uh, code uh, that we are currently discussing, will reverse this phenomenon and ensure better control of our urban areas um, at the moment? Or what do you think should be done? Is that is that uh, more legislation the solution? Or is there something else that has not occurred that we need to be doing in order to ensure that we have planning before development? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I had mentioned, uh, I had uh, touched on the question that you have asked, but I'll just um, touch on it again. And um, my right uh, straight out answer is we don't need any new registration. We already have very good acts. Um, in fact, countries come to us to borrow in terms of law and policy and registration. Uh, what we need now is we need to implement what we have and we need capacity build and give resources for putting in the work. And I can see also from the ready people are asking who and how is it going to be implemented? And it's the same question I would have in terms of the, the acts that we have for uh, guiding, especially urban development. When we look at the physical and land use uh, planning act, the PLUPA of, 19, uh, of 2019, a very new act. Uh, and we just had the comments being taken for the regulations also supporting that act, which I would say they were very well thought of. Uh, very uh, powerful uh, regulations in terms of enforcing development control, in terms of uh, preparation of plans. Uh, preparation of plans, also we, we get it when we look at the Urban Areas and Cities Act or the UACA Act, also a very powerful act. The County Government Act also talks about planning. So I wouldn't say we need any new uh, registration per se, uh, the only thing would be safe for the, for the building code, then we would have to see how we amend the existing act so that we anchor 
the responsibility of who is who in terms of implementing the building code. In terms of the actual planning, which is a preparation of plans, and we will never get it right, no matter how well we develop, uh, we control development or control in terms of uh, giving approvals for buildings if we don't do the planning first, because then you are basing your approval on something which is not uh, there uh, per se. And I think it's a, it's a weakness uh, we've had over and over in our systems where we just have this piecemeal uh, planning interventions in terms of uh, submission of change of user before uh, application for architectural drawings. And I would say we need to go back to the drawing board and implement the acts that we have, the laws and policies that we have, because we have very good policies and, and laws. And if we do implement this, then I think that would be one of the cure for um, making sure that planning comes before uh, development. In terms of already what has already happened, which is what I had termed uh, before as the informality, because this is development which has taken place or preceded before uh, planning has been done, then we have to go back really and see what is practical. And in some of these cases, then some of these standards that we are having even in the, in the blueprint regulations in the building code will not be applicable because these developments don't meet all the standards. So we have to go back and really interrogate what is the bare minimum that we can allow when we are an organization. And I, I think everyone, each and every one of us as professionals in the built environment, we have a, come across uh, these uh, uh, applications in the county government where they even publish and call for people to come and legitimize the informal uh, developments. So we, we need um, a particular set of standards that would allow these developments at least to conform to minimum standards of making sure they have proper ventilation, they have uh, proper access in terms of doorways, in terms of uh, staircases and all these things. So we need um, in the bare minimum, we need bare minimum standards for the informal uh, kind of development. And also we need to implement and um, really empower our authorities to be able to implement the laws that we have and really empower planners to do their work in terms of preparations of plans. So uh, over to you, uh, Florence. Thank you, Planner. And before you go, you mentioned something about informality, saying that this is these are developments that have gone ahead of uh, planning instruments. Would you say that, say for instance, uh, you know, uh, 12, 13, 14 story tower saying Kilimani that has gone ahead in an area that does not yet have policy or regulation and informal development? Just a spanner in the work. Oh, it, it it would be it would be um, a yes or no because uh, in terms of informality, uh, there's of course that informal informal that everyone acknowledges in terms of the slum developments, in terms of uh, the kind of the Zimmermans, the Kayones that are coming up, but also in terms of the 14, 20 stories that we are seeing coming up um, outside of what is. Um, or the default, um, these, are, these are areas that are developing faster than we are revising uh, the zoning regulations. So I would say um, it's a matter of, yes, they are there, but what do we do from there? Do we allow the next property to be a 14, 20 story? Do we stop and ask them to demolish? What is the best way forward? Because we are also developing as a city. We also are pushing for compact cities. We are pushing for more densification, but what is within our limit in terms of our resources and even uh, looking at the infrastructure that we have, yeah? So it goes also hand in hand with um, checking the other policies, even as we, we check the bare minimum. Yes, we have allowed a 14 story here, but we cannot allow this um, the kind of development to the next person to develop, the next one to develop. If you're not going back to check infrastructure, if you're not going back and asking the engineer, can our roads handle the, the traffic that you're going to create? Can we handle the, the waste that we're going to create from these developments? Do we need to review our water systems? Do we need to review our sewerage? Do we have capacity even to handle the solid waste which is generated? So yes, then 
it becomes a matter of cross-cutting, checking on even other policies and laws so that, yes, if we are going towards densification, then some of these policies that we have, especially on transportation, also have to be checked because we cannot afford um, 20 stories, 20 stories building, and yet we are pushing for car use. So it has to go hand in hand also with the revision of other related uh, policies, especially structure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, that quick response. And I, I really appreciate your comments on the same. And it's just a call to us as professionals, as well as uh, anyone here from the counties to really try and push for these policies and regulations and even just some planning instruments that will enable us to either formalize that which is deemed informal right now and also be able to predict the future. I think it's good for business. It's good for being able to have uh, you know, a way forward when you have a document that you can refer to even when you're proposing something to your client. So thank you very much, Plana, for that. I'll, uh, in the same breath, then I'll move to Engineer Sharma. And my question to you, Engineer, is that uh, NCA is the custodian of the draft national uh, building regulations of 2020, which will be domiciled in, in the act. However, development control and enforcement still remain under county governments. What needs to be done to ensure that the custodian of the code, in this case, NCA, also enforces it? Uh, in as far as matters such as inspection, issuance of occupation certificates, ETC are concerned. Uh, Karibu Sana Engineer Kiteme, and uh, we'd love to hear from you on that response. Thank you, Architect Florence, uh, for that good question. Yeah, it's a fact that now by law under the NC Act 41 of 2011, uh, through the amendments last year, the building code will be enforced by NCA. Sorry, engineer, to cut you short. Sorry, we can't hear you. Could you raise your or, or bring your mic closer? All right. So slightly, you me yeah. All slightly, right, thank you. yeah. Thank you. Fantastic. So I'm saying yes. By law, NCA will be enforcing the billing code, but also counties have a role. Now, the two must must have a formula of working together, and I know even in the current situations they're working together. But if you ask me, if we had to improve the processes, I will have a straight answer. Let us go electronic approval and permitting of our development. And I'll give you an example of today, if you need to change, you're transferring a vehicle to another person, for example, you, someone has bought a car from you. You have a platform memes under NTSA. Today, e-citizen platform, you can do so much in terms of your passport and all that. And there is electronic record. Whatever happens on your application, you're able to get SMS notices, for example, at what stage, and you're able to track. Now I know Nairobi County, Kiambu County, and I think lately Kajiado, they have embraced electronics uh, approval processes for development. What if we take this further and make sure that when a billing has been submitted for approval, it is an entry point for creating an electro data, database for that billing. So that the, everything that will be done about that billing, including inspection by NCA, inspection by counties, there is a footprint left on a certain portal about that billing. And this, every person involved in that billing, for example, the architect, the landscape architect, because now I was picked by uh, Kariuki, I mean, the QS, the developer, they get a notification of what is happening about that. Now, the billing code is proposing five yearly, the billing inspections to be carried on a billing. Suppose that inspection and the condition that has been found has also a place to be logged in. An update is done on that um, you know, portal that was created or a record for that billing. What we are going to achieve is that one, we have a central repository of all the information and there can be a collaborative effort between counties, between um, NCA and stuff like that. And there is a record, a, you know, a trail of what has been done. And 
even when it comes to demolition of that building, there is a record that that building was demolished. And then we build up like a centralized database of all information. If I want to buy that building, for instance, I'll be able to, to, to get the conditional status of that building. Today, when you're going to rent a house, you probably don't have a way of asking whether the building has a certificate of occupation. Does it minim meet minimum um, conditions as a building, for example? Some buildings, they actually not held the buildings. And you know, going through, through this process, I've come to appreciate, you know, they are held the buildings and they are sick buildings. But can I tell, is there a record that is central that I can check and establish whether that building is good even before I buy, even before I rent and stuff like that. So, and, 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 and of course, BIM is a big concept that is coming in and enabling such kind of a situation. Now, I'll give you another example. When the guest, Westgate was attacked, was, was attacked, we later learned that part of the challenges that our security, the defense forces were facing is that they did not have that outlay of that building and how they could go in and uh, you know, carry out the rescue process. So we need a process of a central repository of such kind of data, of course, securely. Securely, so that then it is available, it can be used as when needed. And that is not asking for so much because today, if I want to know the owners of a company, for example, I just go to the register of companies. So I believe this is something that we can impress. And um, we have a coordinated and collaborative effort. And there is there are no silos because really, if certificate of occupation has to be issued by counties, um, and, and then the, cons the inspections during construction have to be carried out by, by the NCA, really there has to be a linkage, there has to be collaborative effort. And planning overall, it has to involve all the pl players. Now, the, the building code recognizes the place of other laws, the Standard Act, the, I mean, PLUPA, the Roads Act, you know, the, the Public Health Act, it recognizes them. So there is, it envisions an aspect of collaboration in terms of enforcing this. And so really, um, I kind of uh, emphasize that. And I see electronic, perm electronic permitting of buildings as one big window that we can utilize to make sure that um, this is carried out successfully. Thank you very much, Architect Flores. Thank you very much, Engineer. You have really put it uh, across quite uh, quite well. Um, uh, and I just want to take a, a moment right now, even as we proceed, allow me to probably jump the gun a little bit. I know I had a program that I was following, but at this point, I would like to invite the NCA Executive Director, Engineer Maurice Saketch, to make uh, some few remarks one regarding the building code, but also the ongoing uh, stakeholder engagement on the Business and business Laws Amendment Act that is ongoing. So Karibu Sana Engineer, Maurice Saketch, we are happy to have you. The, uh, the floor is yours. Um, thank you uh, very much, Architect uh, Florence. And uh, also thank you, the K Fraternity. Thank you to the team uh, that's behind the development of the building code. Um, let me show my face. Um, thank you um, everyone who is in attendance as National Construction Authority. Let me start by appreciating the effort and the input uh, being done by um, AK to bring uh, on board the stakeholders um, from the built environment, largely drawn from the architecture of fraternity, of course, supported by other professionals, and appreciate um, this particular engagement because this is one of the things we need to be doing as constitution constitutionally mandated to be able to engage the members of the public, including the professionals like you and uh, stakeholders, to be able to give input in this particular document which is the building code. Indeed, um, this is a journey that started a long time ago, but because Professor Okwaru has been the chair of uh, uh, the building code development committee or the finalization committee has taken us to the presentation uh, in, uh, with addition, additional input from uh, Engineer Kitame, who is also 
a committee member. Um, I want to say that I don't want to go much into details. All I want to say is that uh, this is a very important uh, time in our history as a country that um, since 1968, we are coming to the point where we want to deliver a document that will be uh, responsive to the needs of the built environment, a document that will give us guidance and standards, a document that will enhance quality and safety as far as the built environment is concerned. And that's why we are listening to inputs. We are um, picking them, every bit and piece of it, to be incorporated and reach that document so that when you see it out there, when it's finally published and uh, ready for use, it will be able to be um, um, to meet the objective. A uh, question was raised on the um, level of um, uh, coordination on how this particular document will be implemented in terms of enforcement. I want to confirm that this is a national document. And as you know, um, the government, national government is uh, charged with, with the responsibility of develop, developing national standards, which is particular uh, what we are doing currently, but it will be an adaptive law um, at the county level. So that each county will use it. And because it's, um, it is a performance based, we'll be able to use this document to define and, um, and uh, for, for the ones that are localized, uh, use it to the context within which applies uh, within that particular local environment. So that's how important it's going to be. And in terms of implementation, it will be through coordination and, uh, and uh, cooperation uh, between national and uh, at county level. So we are all here together. And just like in any project, as you all are aware, because you are professionals in projects, you can never do it alone. You can only do it through coordination and uh, cooperation so that you deliver a complete product. So mine is just to appreciate the input and encourage us to give as much as we can. This is an, a moment in history that we cannot um, um, sit back and watch, but we must all come in front, give our input. And I'm happy that uh, everyone is here, especially in this meeting, especially um, um, from the design stage, the, the, the landscaping, all the architects in terms of the professional, the finees are part of it, the interior designers, and everyone. So all this input will be used to uh, enrich the document and make it a better one. The question that has been raised about the ongoing um, um, stakeholder engagement on the other side, which is the amendment of the NC Act, that is actually something that under the, um, the use of doing business, which is um, um, being driven by the Minister of East Africa Community, and uh, we are also participating, um, just like you and everyone else, to give our input. Because as you're aware, um, amendment of any law can be initiated by anyone. It can either be the implementers, it can be the consumers, it can be the users, it can be those who sit uh, on the other side, but they're still um, remotely affected by the, the, the laws. So anybody can initiate an amendment and then we give input. And that's where that particular um, amendment is, is at the moment. I know it's been published for public participation and we are looking forward to participate just like um, um, all of us here. Um, with those few remarks, I want to wish us um, um, a good fruitful engagement. I want to ask that all these discussions we are putting, let them also put them in a, um, a what do you call it, a memorandum or a memoranda so that it can be presented in writing and we'll capture them um, uh, in, in, in a retreat that now will coalesce or compile all the other comments we are getting from all the other stakeholders across the country. So we started this engagement yesterday for this particular building code, and uh, we were targeting the general public. Uh, we started, we divided the country into eight regions, but again, aside from that, we also identified the professionals and other stakeholders that we've written directly to, to also engage uh, their own Professional, uh, professional uh, members in a unique way. And I'm, 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 I'm happy that AK has taken um, a first step in a unique way to engage the members of AK uh, to make their contribution and give us their feedback as far as this comment and concern. So we are looking forward to other professionals as well to also do the same so that we can have all of us uh, making our contribution. Thank you very much and uh, wishing us all the best. 
Thank you very much, uh, engineer, uh, for taking time also to join us and to listen through our webinar. I believe these uh, conversations are very important and we'll be writing back to you with our memorandum uh, as AK on the discussions that we're having today. So as always, thank you so much for the cooperation between the association and the authority, and we look forward to a successful uh, implementation of, uh, or rather making into law this particular code, Asante. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I just wish to bring to, to your attention that uh, we are, there's a point at which this particular webinar had hit the 200 mark. Right now we are at 185. So we are very encouraged to see that a lot of the conversations that we are bringing to you are uh, quite uh, relevant. And we look forward to even getting more questions from you. I believe the chat box is live and alive with a lot of uh, conversation and questions and we'll be getting to you uh, on the same. As I move forward, I also wish to recognize the presence of our uh, of our IPP, uh, Immediate Past President, Architect Tema Miloyo, who will be speaking to us uh, in a short moment, just before we go into the plenary. I will now uh, just quite quickly go back to Landscape Architect Ngumo Karaoke to wind up this conversation regarding legislation on, this emerging on the emerging professions. We know that um, Professions such as landscape architecture, uh, construction project management, and I think I've seen a question on the chat regarding the same uh, environmental design consultants, um, interior designers are not, uh, they are not um, regulated. So it becomes very difficult for the current law to be able to recognize them. Uh, in light of the fact that the fast tracking of the building code so that it gets into, uh, becomes a law is ongoing, what do you, how do you think this can be dealt with um, now that the laws are not yet here and it will take a very long time to probably have them uh, in place, keeping in mind that AK is already engaging in a, in a, in a process uh, together with a coalition of all those professions. I kindly give your thoughts on that, uh, architect, uh, landscape architect. Thank you very much, Lawrence. Uh, I, I would like to say one or two things. First of all, uh, I note that uh, the custodian of this draft is actually attended this meeting. And I'm hoping that uh, in that, uh, uh, with that, uh, what a, a catch, you will uh, incorporate us a little more. Um, I would like to say something. Professions are actually symbiotic. They are supportive of one another and they should have synergy. I think the biggest thing is professions must be independent, like the landscape architectural profession is a profession in its own right. Whether it's recognized here or not, or elsewhere, it is a profession. Um, it's like you cannot ask a mortician to go and supervise a, 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 a surgeon uh, or a surgeon to go and supervise a mortician. They are both doctors but each one deals with dead people, the other one deals with the live people. Now, if you look at this draft, it suggests, for example, now I'm put, drawing this attention to Bona Ketch, it suggests that, uh, or says, that um, a, a, a landscape design will be under supervision of an architect. I think that is not correct because we are an independent profession and I do not believe building the capacity to actually supervise what we do because we deal in a more holistic, scientific, and even artistic uh, environment where we are talking that transcends uh, the, the brief and looks at even uh, creating intellectual, emotional, metaphysical, and even physical experiences. There, we have our niche. And I think the issue should be symbiotic and uh, not where we are saying that, uh, you know, at the draft, it suggests that we work under supervision. How can you work under supervision of somebody who is in a different profession? We are called architects, but we deal with different things. It's like a mortician and uh, a surgeon. We are doctors, but we don't deal in the same way. Now, on the issue of, uh, on the issue of uh, which you've asked to legislation, I think registration and recognition through, for example, an act of parliament is one of the biggest and most important 
uh, element that needs to be acted on. We started trying to act on this since the year 1983-84, so that we can be enjoying the first of all in Cup 525. This has never happened because at the time, various things were happening at the ministry, uh, various ministers, various chief architects, and the board that would have ratified or have had this document even taken to parliament. It never happened. I recall that Honorable Muliungi, when he was uh, chief Sec uh, secretary of works, tried to have this thing or this document ratified and recognition of, for example, landscape architect. And that has never worked today. If, if we are to fast track so that we can control quality, control behavior of how the people we are training behave in the field of what the market demands and deserves, then of course, legislation is important. Uh, there is need for license share, which we've tried to start and currently through the Architectural Association of Kenya, we are trying to get corporate members to increase so that they can be able to, um, to, to provide services across the country. Uh, the issue of uh, local government, local, lo local or, 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 or regional, may I call it, counties now, they need to have a requirement for landscape, not just what we consider as the practical fit for development, but you need, we need to first of all recognize that development also goes ahead together with environment. And there is no other place that needs this profession more than developing countries so that we may not make the, the big mistakes that have been made elsewhere. And for an approvals department for landscape architectural design, uh, uh, for landscape works. There must be legislation that is in place that demands that uh, uh, these services are provided. I think with that, the lack of, of legislation is the biggest weakness that we have. Uh, and also other professionals to see us as people who need to be controlled and put inside a box and removed when you need. But they should consider that actually we are going to be adding value. Uh, and I understand the capacities that we give and we do appreciate uh, every profession actually is needed. Um, so we must have, or we need uh, a unity of purpose and a fellowship uh, that actually matters in terms of the, as far as our environments are concerned and uh, technically uh, uh, for the purpose of developing this country in a logical, conscious, and a sensitive manner. I think I've answered this question on that basis that we do, that's all we need. We, we do need legislation, it's an important element. And thank you very much for asking me that question. Thank you very much, Landscape Architect. I think you have elaborated that very well and that it's a, a, a very collaborative process and we all need to work together. After all, we are all in the same field and, and probably putting together um, uh, all our efforts to ensure that there's uh, quality uh, living spaces. I wish to now take it back to uh, the, the professor, Professor Robert Rukwaro, even as we wind up this particular panel session and prepare ourselves for the Q&A uh, that is already, I can say, quite hot and on fire. We will receive some of the questions, some of the answers in written form, some we will highlight them and I'll have the panelists answer to them. And even as I prepare the prof to come back, um, our poll uh, has the results are back. Um, and I would like to announce, just like they do for the IBC poll, 
The current policy is the draft billing code proposes extended effects and liability periods of a minimum of 24 months and a maximum of 60 months. What are your thoughts on this? I've seen quite a few conversations on the chat regarding the same. A lot of people have discussed uh, issues to do with costs, issues to do with manufacturing, and so on and so forth. And uh, a lot of you are saying that it should be considered and following uh, immediately after that is some of you are saying that it's unacceptable. A very few are actually about 11% are saying that it's very acceptable. So this is a, a conversation to be had and uh, it's probably something that will take uh, us over to the next uh, conversation. Um, I'll now take it to Professor Robert Shukwaro. Uh, Prof, are you there with us? Yes. Yes, Karibu Sana. So my next question, and uh, even as we wind up this panel uh, discussion, um, this process has taken more than 25 years to conclude since the Dr. Mutiso led team. And of course, you've heard from the president and yourself and, and even uh, engineer Morris that about the process that has taken place. What makes this particular process at this point unique? And is it likely to succeed? What means are you using to ensure that this actually happens uh, going forward? Uh, so these are your sort of your last remarks with regards to this particular process. What is the way forward? Thank you. So that, thanks a lot for that, um, that question. And um, what I would say is that um, there is a long history of um, devising our building code and um, I think every time we, we, we are doing it, we are adding value to it. We have to believe that. And um, the current, the current uh, position of uh, revising it, I, I think um, it, 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 will, it will be of completion now, is for realization. Because there are certain things we, we have been able to do now that we have not been able to do before. So what are they? One, it has been very inclusive in terms of um, uh, public participation um, and, and, and other stakeholders' um, participation who are in the construction industry. Two, the, the document have thoroughly been looked at by the drafters uh, from the Kenya Reform Commission and also from the Attorney General's um, office to a level that they have been they have been able to convert the earlier documents into proper standards of building, of building regulations. And, and I think that's, that's, um, that, that's quite uh, a landmark uh, achievement in developing this law, which we have not been able to achieve previously. The, the other thing that uh, we, we have also done is that uh, the, 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 current, the current institution that uh, this code is domiciled, they, they are very proactive. They have been able to really pull together all the efforts of, of everybody to be able to achieve what we are seeing. What I mean here is that uh, the NCA, the National Construction Authority, when they were told they were mandated to actually complete the process, they have actually put a lot of resources and a lot of manpower to really achieve what we are trying, uh, what we are actually discussing today. And I think that, 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 that in terms that, that is important, that the, 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 the institution that is governing this process is very interested and in that uh, is, has been able to attract wider participation by majority of the, uh, the, the, the stakeholders. Finally, what I is that um, the, the, the result of this process, as you all know, um, one, the document you are working with came from the Attorney General's office. They are the one actually who issued for public participation. That means they have recognized the document is ready actually to, to go to, to, to the finalization. Because after this process, what you do is actually the, 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 the NCA will actually prepare all these discussions and, and memorandum that you actually uh, create a revision. Then you go to validation after they, we, we, we input all what people are now uh, saying. Then you go for validation. 
Then after validation, actually the document can go now to parliament to actually be discussed by different committees there before it actually runs to the parliament for advice, whether it is okay. So, so I think this process in terms of legality, it has gone quite far as opposed to, to other documents that uh, did not actually get this far. And that's what I feel now we will conclude it. And actually, as you had, some, somebody had said earlier, we have tried to remove conflicts with other laws as much as possible. And that's why Prupa, we actually said all the administration issues to do with the building to be put in Prupa, where already they had captured that spirit in their, in their act. So I, I can see this actually being a very conclusive uh, process now. And actually, we are looking forward for June to have been en enacted uh, to, to a registration that we can actually apply in a big environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. I think your words are quite important uh, in leading this process and ensuring that we move forward. Um, I can already see a comment on the chat saying that uh, we've waited 25 years. Why can't we wait a little bit longer in view of the fact that uh, other professions need to be regulated so that they are on board? I think we'll take that comment uh, and, and see how that can happen. Uh, quite a strong uh, saying that you should not conclude this document until you look at all the sections that are being highlighted. Remember, this is a sort of a stakeholder engagement. We're trying to pick views from you and we'll be able to share them uh, quite strongly uh, to, to NCA so that they're able to be taken into account. And I believe then it will, it will uh, um, indicate uh, the way forward uh, of this process. Um, another question that had come earlier to you, um, and this says, besides our revised building code, what other element is most important in ensuring safety in the built environment? And the, the responses here say a stronger enforcement, uh, which we've been discussing, I'm talking about implementation. The other one which are uh, competing is adequate public education on the process of the building. For instance, the Jerunam Jenga, which we normally handle uh, much, much, uh, you know, towards the middle of the year. And then we have availability of professionals in all the counties. So I think all those three things are important and uh, something that we will look into. And thank you very much uh, for this particular question. These questions are being guided to us by the research and advocacy manager, uh, um, James Odongo. Thank you very much, James, for that. Um, even as we proceed and prepare ourselves for the Q&A session, there are quite a few questions. So you'll allow me to bundle some of them that could be uh, in thematic areas. And as we prepare to do that, I will now invite the immediate past president, architect Emma Miloyo, uh, to make a presentation on building in Kenya that is in line with our current uh, theme for the evening. Karibu sana, architect Emma. Um, yes, thank you so much, uh, Florence. and. Uh, it's not, um, I don't take it for granted as an IPP, uh, internally displaced person or IDP, uh, to be given an opportunity to come back to my old association and speak to members. It's really a privilege. And um, listening to the conversations, it's really just wonderful that we're having very healthy discussions and finally discussing something that's very important, a building code that sort of sets the standard of building in, 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 in our country. and. I think the challenge to all of us as professionals is um, like uh, Juliet Rita said, Planet Juliet Rita said that we have a, enough legislation. We have a lot of codes, uh, porn codes, but really the challenge to us as professionals is to aspire to implement the best that we can in our projects uh, um, and not to embrace mediocrity from, 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 from us as professionals, from those who are charged with um, um, enforcement and ensuring that people are building to standard. So really just, uh, it, it's wonderful that we're having this conversation, but I think where the rubber meets the road will be in, in, in seeing how we actualize this and how as professionals, as government, um, and see, uh, seeing how we make uh, the built environment that much better because the truth be told in the last 30 years, 25 years, we've seen a great deterioration in terms of um, the quality of buildings, the character of our urban environments. But uh, just to, Mention something, um, and, 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 and as Florence said, in line with uh, um, the theme for today, it's about standardizing um, um, and, and ensuring their codes that people can follow um, and be able to measure against in terms of quality. And in, in just in light of that, um, um, and 
is, as having served as uh, president of AK and looking around and seeing how people were building, I felt challenged and um, um, my co-author and I, Robin Emerson, who's also a planner, felt challenged to take on some, some level of what we call personal social responsibility and equip Kenyans um, with their own sort of code and standard of what the building process is from beginning to end, financing your projects, following what, what is the building code, what documents should they look out for? How should they hire the professionals that we've talked about and engaged so much about on this session? How do I buy land? Because we find many times people do not have information. So I'd just like um, to challenge all of you, um, if you can, get your clients a copy of this book so that they, they also have a code by which they, they implement their projects. And in so doing, um, I think what we aspire to, even as the authors of this book, is to have a, a built environment, a better informed client, and when we have a better informed client, they will hire, they will hire better informed professionals who will then implement uh, better projects. So just at, um, calling on all of you, if you, if you haven't got yourself a, a copy of Building in Kenya, a uh, great time to gift your clients uh, as the year begins, as they set their targets. Um, just visit uh, www.buildingincenya.co.ke and you can uh, get a copy of this book which in some sense uh, really ties in with what we're talking today about standardizing and mapping processes um, that therefore make it so much easier for Mwanainchi out there to know uh, the standard to which uh, their buildings should be built to and the processes that they should. So Asante Sana to the AAK for the great work you have done um, through this period, even COVID has been a tough time, but you've kept us engaged uh, virtually or otherwise. and. Um, we really, really, as, 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 as members, appreciate the association and for giving me this opportunity to speak on such an important platform. So thank you so much and over to you, Florence Asante. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, sorry, thank you very much, IPP. Uh, internally, we call her IDP as a displaced person at this point. But thank you so much for your leadership over the years uh, to the association. And I think uh, you've gone ahead of us and enabled us to also remain strong and active in advocating for the, uh, for, for the objectives of the association. So thank you very much. And a call to all of us to take a look at the book and, uh, and, and, and be sure that you actually have something at hand that sometimes can assist you in, in discussing uh, those standards with the client. So even as I move forward to um, the questions, I would like to start off with uh, Professor uh, Rukwaro. And I think one of the first questions that came here is with regards to the, uh, the law being an adoptive law. We got a question from Rita Mugo asking, what does it mean that the law, the building code will be an adoptive law? Uh, you had also discussed the issue of a descript uh, before it was prescriptive and now it's a performance-based law. Could you cl kindly clarify on the same? And as we proceed, I'll be bundling up the questions because there are very many. I think we have more than 50 comments uh, on, the, on, on the chat. We may not be able to answer all of them, but we are taking note of all of them and we'll be able to try as much as possible to respond to them through the memorandum that will be sent to NCA and will be shared with everyone who's attended this particular webinar because I believe all of us registered somewhere uh, on the same. Karibu sana prof and uh, probably give us your insight on, on this. Thank you. So um, thanks a lot for that, um, that question. When you say a law is adaptive, what it means is that um, at the national level, we come at the law that pre comes up with the principles, comes up with the um, general guidelines, uh, especially for us in the building, we come up with the principles for building walls, for building roofs and the rest. Then since this, our country has different geographical areas, it has about six geographical areas or so, main ones, so what it will mean that it will mean is in hot, humid climate, this law cannot be applied exactly the way it is. The people of Mombasa have to adapt it to, to, to the climate. Certain things have to be adapted within the, the, the requirement of that area. So the, the county assembly will look at this document and customize it depending on the culture, on the context, of, of that area. In, in other words, what the national government is doing, it is guiding on the standards of buildings, but when it comes to the applications, things might change. Like when you talk about material, 
you know, certain material be more available certain areas and not other areas. So, so the local people can actually enact within their local assembly things that can actually be different from what we are giving the, the public or to the counties. So the counties will adapt this one just as the building code. The building code was also adaptive and it, it was adapted depending on the local authority of specific regions. I, I think the other question that uh, was asked was to do with the, um, the other question was, uh, the other question that uh, was asked was to do with, what had you asked? There's something else that was asked, eh? but, but basically, uh, there's another question that was asked apart from uh, adaptive. Um, regarding the law, I was just yeah, saying that I'm also saying with regards to the um, the issue of performance based uh, versus oh, what yeah. is currently is the prescript prescriptive. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what I can say is that uh, <clears throat> the, the 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 building code of 1968 was very specific on the materials that you use to build and you should not use to build. For example. It would say use concrete, use masonry, and it specified the sizing of, of those materials. And then it would say that you should not use dash and many other materials and so forth. In other words, it discouraged the vernacular architecture so much. Okay. But currently, the law that you have come up with is if you look at the, the beginning of every part, we first of all pick out the principles. The principles of what does a war require? A war require that um, it, it is able to carry certain weight, structural stability, it talks about um, acoustic issues, it talks about thermal issues and the rest. And then after that, it, it details now the parts of wars and different descriptions of, of how the, the war standards, different standards of the war. But, but, but that, it leaves a lot of room to, to the designers now to come up with a wall that meets those principles of, of the wall, of the requirement of the wall. So that now we are not telling somebody, go ahead and use masonry, go ahead and use concrete, or go ahead and use timber. We, we are leaving it for the, the designers really to be more innovative by giving guidelines what he has to meet. And if it is tested in a laboratory and it meets those requirements, then it means he cannot use that innovated material uh, for construction. Thank you. I thank you very much, Prof, for um, elaborating on the same. I wish to move to Engineer Sharma. And uh, there's a question here with regards to Eurocode. I believe you saw it uh, on the Q&A. Um, I don't know if it has already been, been answered, but I'd like to bundle that with this, the file. Uh, standards. We've also seen a question regarding regulation of uh, ICT uh, infrastructure, as well as um, regulation of mechanical and electrical engineers. A question has also come through whether uh, they will be, uh, they will require to also share approved drawings to the counties uh, when this particular law comes into place. Perhaps you could uh, uh, elaborate on the same. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, Architect Florence, for that good question as a series of questions actually. So what I will try to respond to is first on Eurocodes. Kenya gazetted Eurocodes in 2012 as a standard for design, for structural design. So what has been happening between 2012 and 2021, there's been a process of adapting Eurocodes through the development of what you call national annex. And effectively going forward, because of the Eurocodes being the standards for structural design, recognizing the building code, it will be expected draw, um, design, structural design is done to meet those um, um, according to Eurocodes uh, as it were. On electrical engineers, uh, mechanical engineers and all that, if you go to the section of um, electrical installations, it is expressly stated in the building code, something like, uh, circuit breaker. There has to be a design done by the electrical engineer and certified. 
if you go to HVAC and stuff like that, the billing code sets out that the mechanical engineer has to design and certify, for example, fire fighting installations. So increasingly, the space has been opened up for everyone um, to be able to do their part and certify that um, basically the, the, it meets the performance expectations as it were on that particular aspect. And we all have different roles. Um, ICT, I want to imagine that ICT, and I need to confirm in the document, they are under electrical installations. Uh, and I want to check that because I remember the conversation at the committee stage, uh, because we had an electrical engineer in the, in the committee, and I remember such conversation, but I need to check whether they are actually in the, in the electrical installations. I don't know whether I've answered everything, architect Florence. Thank you, engineer. Yes. So this, uh, are we saying that this particular codes and uh, standards are going to be implemented in good time or will they form part of the current uh, legislation? Let me Just tell to you. to clarify, yeah. Um, the implementation of Euro codes is under Kenya Bureau of Standards. It is something that has been ongoing. But for the comfort of everyone, once something is gazetted in this country, as, it, as they were gazetted in 2012, and because you have to domesticate it, they were gazetted, and we are supposed to use nation, UK national annex when we are designing um, to Euro codes. Currently, under CAPS, the process of developing the national annex for Kenya is ongoing. But I will tell you in my office, I design to Eurocodes. I don't design uh, to BS because it is a law. In fact, increasingly, if you design to BS and all that, you may find your designs rejected at the counties at the point of approval. And I once submitted a design a uh, years back, some years back to Nyamira County. And the whoever was looking at my design, he asked me, why have you submitted uh, uh, B bus, you know, deformed bus, as opposed to H bus, for example, because Eurocodes has already moved from T, D bus to H bus. When you talk of uh, a diameter 10 bar, we call it H10, not D10, not T10, something like that. So increasingly, uh, you will face, face challenges. You submit your drawings and uh, it, they are not to Eurocodes, um, if that can clarify. Thank you very much. Thank you, engineer. I think, yes, you have clarified on the same. And thank you very much. I think we should uh, subject ourselves to the higher standard uh, or whatever it is that we feel will become the higher standard even as we go forward. And I think it's a call to maybe those who are following certain codes to probably aspire to follow the higher standard or the more uh, stringent standard. Um, I'd like to move this uh, particular question to our planner, Juliet. Um, it's just a question on the Q and A, and it says in Kenya we have subdivision of land being done up to thirty feet by sixty feet, and even smaller sizes and legal titles issued. The owners of these parcels of land usually like to maximize it its use by constructing multi-story structures. However, with the coming draft uh, implemented, it's not possible to comply with this. Is planning being taken? Uh, well, let me ask the question: Is planning? Um, being taken into consideration on the above. Karibu Plana Juliet. Well, thank you very much. I had actually attempted to answer that on the chat and I ended up typing all the words that I could get. Um, it's quite a complex issue when you touch on land in Kenya because uh, we all know issues of land, yeah? Uh, so we've always had this disconnect in terms of um, approval of subdivision. Uh, you go to most uh, parts of the country and you find, um, sorry if there are any surveyors in the house, but surveyors will always find a way around of doing the subdivision, submitting the mutation plans and getting new titles without following the approval process of subdivision. Now the approval process as it is in the act is, um, by law, they are required first to do to have a plan in approval, get a PPA two form from the county government, and then process the new titles. 
Now with this um, small anomaly where a surveyor will proceed and get a new title, that's when we are having uh, small pieces of land that are not even in accordance to the, to the minimum uh, land sizes as we have them. Uh, just to go back again to the adaptive um, the, uh, laws, we are enabled by act or the county government actually are enabled to adapt any law to suit um, their normal or their, their local uh, setting. So you will find in most of the counties actually they have um, some sort of documents that they have or regulations that they have adapted in the county assembly that dictate or guide the minimum land sizes. And none of the counties I've gone around have the kind of land sizes that we encounter when we are processing development applications. There's also that issue of people having the share certificates, um, which are not uh, formally subdivided. They're not formally approved. So again, you find we have issues of very small, tiny pieces of land. And we had very um, unique cases, especially in Juja, where we had plot sizes which were not even adequate for, say, uh, a single room to, to go by. So this is a major challenge that um, is there currently. And I would call upon us professionals, um, land surveyors especially, and planners to really ensure that any subdivision is done in accordance to the law. Because if you follow the law, then we have the minimum standards in terms of um, the minimum size of uh, roads that we should need for certain subdivisions, uh, the minimum land sizes, uh, the minimum um, users or the bare minimum that you can allow in terms of usage for the, such kind of, uh, of land. Again, just to add to another question which had been asked in terms of setbacks and um, the building lines and all these things that we recommend in terms of how much you can build on your land. That's ground coverage, uh, plot ratios. Again, um, this has to go with the adaptive law in the county in terms of the bare minimum that they have. So yes, what is said as a uh, professor has said, we have the higher standards in the, in the building code but the county government has a leeway in terms of implementing um, the zoning regulations and they can actually zone uh, their area. Like if you go to Nairobi, you, you realize they have zoned uh, Nairobi in, in, in codes, yeah? So you will find uh, zone one, two, three, four going downwards, yeah? So you find each zone then has different um, setbacks, different ground coverage, different plot ratios. And this will take into account um, even the, the, the type of uh, the typology and the, and the uh, scape that we, we want for our urban areas. And again, uh, just to support Robert, apart from landscape architects, I think it's also a high time as Kenyans, we demand that we have professional urban designers to actually design uh, our cities because then would uh, have these things uh, normalized so that if we are talking of say a street in the CBD then we can allow plots uh, to build up to 100% uh, coverage. We can allow more plot coverage. Uh, we can allow some of these things to be adaptive depending on what is suitable for, for certain areas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Planarita. And uh, I just uh, really, really uh, thank you so much for responding to that. Um, I just noticed that uh, even as I try to probably ask questions to a landscape architect, most of them are coming in as uh, comments and, and, and really just uh, uh, commending him for the conversation that he has put forth. Um, and I also note that amongst us, we do have um, members of the Coalition of the Built Environment uh, uh, Professionals, and uh, this is uh, none other than uh, National Kwa, who is the uh, chair of ACMK. We are together in the uh, Coalition of Built Environment, and we are working towards a legislation uh, which will uh, bring together uh, all these emerging professions and ensure that they are regulated. So thank you very much, Nashon, uh, for taking time to join us. And he does make a comment saying that we, we need we need to have all this legislation on board so that by the time the building code is in place, those, um, those particular uh, professions are already recognized as opposed to waiting another many years 
uh, so that that happens. So thank you very much for your comment. At the same time, I also wish to note that we do have members of the academia who also joined us. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Isabella Njeri. We have architecture Tamugo. Uh, we've got uh, Tom Oketch, who's also uh, with us here. And, and really thank you and, and many others. I may not be able to mention each and everyone. I see Dr. Ralwala as well, and quite a number who've been able to join us. Arthur Adair, thank you very much. I think it's very important, even as we discuss the building code, these are some of the things that we'll be handing down uh, to those who are going through school and be able to be there. Um, even right now, as I continue, I also see Gikonyo Bitonga, the chair of uh, Kepsa Land Sector Board. Thank you very much, um, uh, uh, Gikonyo, for joining us as well. And thank you for uh, taking time to be with us. I think it's a very important point, and he presents uh, a very uh, important session in, in uh, section within our, our uh, industry. I also wish to recognize that we also have members of the AAK leadership through the council uh, of uh, various chapters uh, who have been serving. Maybe most of them have now uh, either handed over power or have just come into power. So thank you to all the council members uh, of, a of AAK and also the governing council, the members of the governing council who've also been able to been able to join us. This is a joint effort and this is some of the uh, work that we are doing together here. Uh, also, we have uh, representatives from our coast branch. I, I see architect Imran here. I also want to note um, uh, that over and above this, um, we are talking a lot about development control and it's important to note that AK will be organizing a session uh, with the Nairobi Metropolitan Service regarding development control and the e permitting system. And I think all of us are being affected by that. We'll be having a session with them on 3rd of March, uh, 2021 uh, at 4 p.m., a session that will take place at a time such as this. And we hope that we'll have as many of you uh, joining us here. We Earlier on, we had Plana Mutegi who heads that particular uh, uh, section within uh, within the NMS who was who had also joined us. So thank you to everyone. I may not be able to recognize as many people as possible uh, as, as I could wish to do so. I see a lot of questions uh, coming in and we've been able to note all of them. I think I want to finish with one last question. And this question goes to you, uh, Prof, uh, regarding a question by Eric Kigada. That was a follow-up to one of the polls that we had. And uh, Eric says, and I, I think he's also mentioned um, something else as well uh, in the question and answer chat. And uh, Eric uh, says that um, in a part of the, just allow me to scroll to it uh, in, in a short moment. I, I think the chat has moved now that the questions are coming uh, in droves. Um, just as we are, we are commencing, he says that part 561, reuse of secondhand materials is not allowed. Why are we not allowed to recycle materials in buildings in view of the fact that we're asking what is the most important thing when it comes to uh, selection of building materials. A lot of people say that it's sustainability and reuse or recycle is a very important thing, but we are talking about secondhand materials in the building code not being allowed. Perhaps you could discuss that and maybe broaden it a little bit when it comes to the uh, alternative building materials. Thank you very much. Karibu Sana Prof, uh, you answer that question. Yes, and um, I think that's that's a good question. Can we start from this premises that um, when we when we design, we specify materials that have been approved by a certain organization. So in this case, materials that we get from retail is materials that has been approved by Kenya Bureau of Standards. So that one, we are very sure that when you buy steel from a hardware shop, it is approved uh, material that we have specified for our, our designs. So when we, let's say now you, you demolish a concrete uh, floor slab, there are some reinforcement there, or you demolish a column, there are some reinforcement there. Already that material has been uh, in use it has been exposed to different weather elements. It can be rusty, it can have cracks and so on. To ensure ourselves when we are constructing that the material has the correct strength, it's not defective, this code emphasizes that we actually use material as specified from 
Kenya Bill of Standards that has outlets in the retail shops. I think that that should be very clear. Otherwise, these materials that are out there, which are arising out of demolition or, or leftovers and so on, it, it has already been exposed to a, a certain level of, of weather condition or certain uh, strengths, and, and then it has weakened. So we cannot assume it's the same as material that is new. So it's just to ensure ourselves that the defect did not occur because the material used had some defects at the time of use. And, and I think the specifications that the, the, the consultants in any building make becomes of importance when we actually specify material from the correct outlet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. And uh, before I let you go, I'd like you to give us your closing remarks and uh, also alert the other panelists to prepare their closing remarks. Thank you very much. So, um, colleagues, we this document we are discussing today, which is a building code and regulation, it is ours. It is for us to use in our practice. It, it doesn't belong to anybody else, it's ours. So we own it. It is us to perfect it. It is us to enforce it. It is us to leave it. Let's ensure that we work together towards the realization of the only document in Kenya that talks about building regulations. There is no other document. The only other document we can talk of is the building code that we are revising, and you know the status of that building code. So let's embrace ourselves with this document. Let's create public participation. Let's create advocacy to ensure that this document goes through. We don't have time to revise it, but at least we'll have something to work with. And this document, if implemented, it will actually remove a lot of quacks in our construction industry. Because now there will be a law that is very inclusive to all the failures we can see out there in our built environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof, uh, for that uh, uh, clarion call that uh, let's, let's rally behind this and have something at least that will begin to guide us uh, going forward. Remember the last, the building code that we currently have is 1968, and even that was repealed uh, when the County Governments Act came on board. I used to invite uh, Engineer Sharma Kitema to give his closing remarks. Thank you very much, Architect uh, Florence, and thank you for this opportunity to interact over this document. This document has gone through involvement of stakeholders, academicians, professional consultants, and the AG has gone through the document, and the invitation from professionals to give their input is basically to add value, and I am very grateful for the kind of comments you have received. I think we all, all of us, owe a responsibility uh, to the society to give the best. Let us join hands in making sure that um, the built environment is done to the best standards possible. And when situations arise that you cannot offer your professional services, I mean, professional ethics, which govern our practice, all of us, they revolve around responsibility they revolve around um, uh, respect, they revolve around fairness, they revolve around honesty. Let us go and indicate what cannot be done because it's basically unprofessional. Let us avoid, you know, stamping drawings and just to get the 5,000 and, uh, and, and, you know, we don't know what goes out, do that. We don't know what the design was and stuff like that. I think we must take that responsibility as professionals to bring discipline to the industry. And it's my role, it's your role, and when everything is good, we'll be happy. And this building code is a very good starting point. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, engineer. 
um, uh, we, we urge everyone to actually take time to send their comments to our research and advocacy manager. The contact, contacts have been put on, on the chat as we proceed. I see here uh, Simon Nguni who had uh, raised his hand for quite some time. Perhaps I'll give you this opportunity. You have exactly 30 seconds to ask your question or comment, uh, Simon Nguni. Thank you. Uh, Simon Guni, are you there with us? Excuse, you have exactly 30, sorry, 30 seconds as we wind up. All right, I'd like to request that he's muted and uh, we proceed. I'd like to go to Planarita uh, to give you your final remarks. Thank you, Florence. I think uh, most of you have already reached out to say you've had my cows. <laughs> You're eating into their milk in time. <laughs> but anyway, it's the beauty of staying just outside the city. And I hope the building code will not block me from staying with my cows. Um, my last remark would be on us uh, finding a way to find um, to win really look into the document, I think we, we usually have this thing of uh, saying it's really not my risk. Uh, the other person will look at it, but I'm calling upon each and every one of us who are present today. Call on your other professionals, please have them look at uh, sections of the code that relate to them. Uh, let them comment, even look at other sections that I feel are not really related to them, but they affect them. Uh, it's really, really important that we get um, the best that we can out of this opportunity. It is a golden opportunity, and I don't think we need another 25 years to get it right. We can get it right here and now. Uh, we can also get it right in terms of uh, really looking at how we can have this uh, code implemented right to the, to the ground. So it's upon us, we need to get into the work and push also for uh, professionals who are not recognized uh, legally right now, like the landscape architects. And I'm also adding the urban designers who are very, very important for our urban areas. Uh, we really have to support our brothers and sisters to make sure that um, they're entrenched in the building code, and that they become recognized uh, professionals who are registered uh, in, the, in, the, in the profession. It's also a call for us as AK to really push to have uh, counties employing uh, professionals, uh, either whether they have capacity, permanent staff, or to contract staff, we need to support them in terms of uh, implementing some of these things that we are passing in this new, new news. So thank you very much. And I wish to thank everyone who's participated and all the questions that have been coming our way. It's really been an engaging uh, forum and I'm happy to be part of this process. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Planner Juliet. I now invite uh, landscape architect uh, Robert Karaoke to give his closing remarks. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, I would like to concur with my principal, Professor Okwaro, that actually this document is ours. We are really, we do have an opportunity, a golden opportunity I think it's important for all of us not to think about just the boundaries that we sit upon. This country happens to have a fantastic uh, leverage over making fashion ideas and disseminating them with the region. We have an opportunity to lead the region and uh, we have an opportunity to improve uh, our built environment with the resources that we have. Remember, I think we are the only country in Eastern Central Africa that is actually training landscape architects. We also have a golden opportunity to export our labor elsewhere. There's a lot of synergy to be found out of this, uh, this, this document. And uh, uh, they, they, a lot of energy, uh, as my closing remark, a lot of energy has been expended uh, in developing this document especially by those who have been involved right from the beginning to the end, including the chair. 
And uh, I think uh, the distance left is very small and the changes left are so small that actually we can make something that we can all be proud of. And thank you very much for having me and uh, giving me the privilege of being able to contribute meaningfully, I hope, to this, to this, uh, to this uh, forum. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Landscape Architect. And I think uh, you, the members of that particular chapter have, have really been on board, including uh, the outgoing chair. I believe uh, Ambrose Fafa has been on board and he's really calling upon us looking at Singapore as an example uh, in terms of legislating uh, going forward. I also wish to invite the president maybe to make some closing remarks before I invite uh, our CEO Jacob to close the session. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Florence. Um, I think for me, I don't really have much more to add, just to say thank you to the panelists, to the very excellent moderator we have had today. Florence, thank you so much. And of course, to the AK team that has been um, uh, coordinating this webinar. Um, and most of all, to all the participants. Uh, this session has been so vibrant and engaging and I've just been reading through the chat and the questions and answers and, and quite a lot of um, good comments are coming in. So just to encourage AK members, we are preparing the memoranda right now to send to NCA. So we kindly request, please very urgently send in your comments to james at aak.or.ke and we shall include them. Asante. Asante Sana, Madam President, and we truly appreciate you for your leadership uh, in this uh, particular uh, manner, and we've been able to really engage uh, in this session. So without much further ado, I am really grateful that I have been your moderator for this session, but uh, just like everything else, there's always a host, and in this case, our host is the CEO, Jacob Mwangi. He'd like to, I'd like to invite him to make his, uh, to close this particular session and uh, dismiss us. Karibu Sana, Jacob. Um, thank you so much, Florence, for, for, for the session that you've just uh, been running. It has uh, been a very good event, as you mentioned in the past. We have had more than 200 people participating this um, afternoon, and it's been a very, very interactive session. And we must thank every member and every person who took time to participate um, in this session uh, this afternoon. Importantly, I want to, to, to recognize the leadership of the association led by our president, Madam Mugure Njendu, who has been uh, a champion of uh, advocacy in regard to the building code in Kenya, and of course, building up on the work that um, Emma Miloyo and Steve Oundo, who I can see there with us today. Thank you very much for the effort that you've put to make sure that we've gotten here. They have uh, the revision of this code, and we must recognize the effort that they have uh, made, especially with the leadership of NCA that has been very collaborative, very consultative, and we're hopefully going to conclude this um, revision in the very uh, short time from now. And um, also to thank our speakers, um, Professor Rukwaro, uh, Engineer Kiteme, Dana Juliet Ruta, and uh, Robert Karioki for sharing your expertise and your experience and uh, for the benefit of the industry and for the persons who participated this uh, afternoon. And importantly, we need to thank all members who've taken time to join us because uh, you've made uh, this uh, event very fruitful, very constructive, because it's going to inform our memorandum that will be sending to the NCA. And as the president said, please take time to, if for those who have not, please take time to throw in some of the comments that you may have, because it's going to enrich our memorandum and of course uh, the um, building code that we hope to get completed very, very soon. So thank you so much. And we look forward to continued engagement. As uh, Florence mentioned, we are going to have another session in two weeks time. Uh, with the Nairobi Metropolitan Services. Please uh, save the date. We'll be having a, a similar session with uh, um, Tandam Tegi. Thank you so much and wish you all a very good afternoon. Kariboni.
Thank you very much, um, AAK, for this uh, opportunity for the interview. Uh, my name is uh, Engineer Maurice Akech. I am the Executive Director of National Construction Authority. Uh, this is an institution which is um, a, regular, a regulator for the construction industry in Kenya. National Construction Authority um, has uh, an overall mandate uh, which is uh, to oversee the construction industry and coordinate its development. Um, but if I break it down um, uh, so that at least it's clear and uh, um, we know uh, what we do so that anybody looking for uh, those services can always know where to get them, uh, we do three key things. Uh, one is uh, regulatory, uh, the second one is capacity building, and the third one is uh, advisory. Under regulatory mandate, our role is to uh, register uh, contractors. So any contractor undertaking any construction business in this country um, must get license from National Construction Authority, whether they are uh, locally incorporated companies as local contractors or indigenous contractors, or whether they are contractors coming from outside Kenya. Uh, for them to do a um, construction project, they must have a license from the National Construction Authority. And of course, um, uh, because of different sizes in terms of capacity of those contractors, uh, we categorize them uh, into the high caliber contractor, which is NC1, to the smallest uh, contractor, which is NC8. So the rest fall in between. Um, they also uh, classified into whether they are doing roadworks, uh, waterworks, uh, building works, um, mechanical works, electrical works. So all that is a class of uh, a work that can be registered under the CA in a certain category. So category is the size in terms of capacity. Class is the specifics of the work to be done. And we register all types of contractors, whether they are whichever kind of project they're doing, as long as it's a construction project. The other regulatory mandate is basically accreditation of construction workers. These are uh, those who are mostly employed by contractors. So here I'm talking about skilled construction workers in various trades and uh, construction site supervisors. Accreditation here means that um, if, for instance, you're a plumber or you're an electrician or you're a mason or any other trade you may think about, if now uh, we, um, uh, you have done